Hello everyone, welcome to Scorch Our Toys at AnyMoon.com's review of Takatoku's 13000 scale SDF-1 Macross toy. This toy was originally released in Japan in 1983 for the rather hefty price by that day's standards of 5,800 yen. In one of those worst timing ever moments, Takatoku went bust in 1984 just as Macross Do You Remember Love hit theaters. While the courts worked things out, Takatoku's business partner Matsuhiro released numerous unbranded Takatoku products. The most famous of these is the Transformer Jetfire, but there are plenty of 1100 scale VF1 and 13000 scale SDF1 toys in off packaging that are probably Matsuhiro products. In 1985, Takatoku's bankruptcy was settled and Bandai acquired a huge suite of Takatoku molds and licenses, including this 13000 scale SDF1. In Japan, Macross Mania had moved on to Do You Remember Love, but Robotech was just gaining steam outside of Japan. Since Big West, Tatsunuku, and Harmony Gold weren't fighting yet, Matchbox was able to strike a deal with Bandai to produce a few Macross products that Matchbox would slap their name on and sell outside of Japan. So in 1985, the Bandai produced SDF-1 Battle Fortress sold under the Robotech license by Matchbox made its way to store shelves with an MSRP of $39.95 US dollars. There were a few changes made to ramp up the safety of the toy, and I'll be chronicling each of them shortly. But suffice it to say, this review also covers the Matchbox release of the SDF-1. Both toys sold very poorly and were eventually sold for a fraction of MSRP before the decades made them collector's items you can only find on the secondary market. If you're hunting for something more recent, I shop at Big Bad Toy Store and I recommend you do as well. Click through my link in the comments below to have fun shopping and help this channel in the process. Both these toys come in premium boxes. The Matchbox toy comes in a bright box with nice artwork and a flip top lid that lets you look at the goods within without having to slide out the styrofoam tray. Once you do pull that tray out, you'll find stickers and instructions tucked into a couple cavities. The Takatoku box features the premium textured cardboard and excellent artwork that were Takatoku's trademark. The box has a lid that can be removed to expose a secondary lid with windows, again allowing you to enjoy the toy without actually having to handle it. When you do remove the tray, you'll find stickers and instructions, though they are unique to this release. You'll also find two vehicle sets, the first containing two mini VF1, and a second containing a Lancer 2, a Ghost, and an additional VF1. You also get a set of missiles. Any of these accessories may come in blue, red, or green. We're going to start in cruiser mode, and I'm going to begin by demonstrating the differences between the Takatoku toy and the Bandai Matchbox toy. To start with, you have some gun slots in the front. That's, they're present on both toys, but on the Takatoka only toy, you get the little launcher mechanism. So there's a spring inside, you put the bullet in, you hit that button and it shoots outward, which is a little bit more fun. Going towards the back, we have a same or similar idea on the aircraft carriers. So you can put the little airplane on there, bring the catapult back, fire the catapult. And then even in the legs here, you have a launching mechanism there. So a little rocket launcher is built into the legs, which is pretty cool. Uh, one thing to look for that makes things nice and obvious is you have the stamp from the manufacturer on the foot. So if you're not sure if you have a knockoff or the real deal, look down here at the bottom. If this is blank or it looks like someone drilled something off, then you have a knockoff. If it says Takatoku, you have a Takatoku or Bandai for the Matchbox version, which I can show you. There, so there's the Bandai one. Okay, so moving right along, there are some other aspects to the toy that are slightly different, although they're pretty hard to even notice. First of all, we have the antennae on the bridge. So here's your bridge antenna. Here it is on the Bandai toy, which hopefully I can get them close enough. And you should be able to see that on the Bandai toy, it's got a little bit thicker edges to it, a little bit more rounded. Also the uh, antenna behind the bridge, pointy on the Takatoku version and round and stubby on the Bandai version. And then obviously the Bandai toy, very white, very stark white, not no stickers applied at the factory. The Takatoka toy, I can't swear all of these stickers were applied at the factory, but certainly several of them are, so it comes with some detail right out of the box. And of course, you do get those sticker sheets, which you could add more detail 
Whereas on the Bandai toy, you're adding all of the detail. So those are differences to look for. One more, the rail guns on the shoulders. They are stubby, come to an end here on the Takatoku, very sharp point at the end. Not very sharp, but compared to the Bandai toy, which has very rounded edges on the rail guns. So now you know the differences between them. Here's the Bandai toy. It still has the holes for the launching mechanisms. It just doesn't have the launchers anymore. No catapults on the aircraft. You still have the ability to pop this up and pretend like you're shooting stuff, but there's nothing in there to shoot. You do have the storage bays, which is pretty cool. On the Takotoku toy, you're gonna shove your little projectiles and airplanes in there. Uh, on the Bandai toy, you don't really need to. The fact that it has built-in storage is really cool because that means you don't have to go fish your box out. Uh, but on the Bandai toy, that storage doesn't really do anything for you. You do have the ability on any toy to remove the aircraft carrier. The aircraft carrier do have little wheels on the bottom, and so you can play with them on their own. No ability to open the front of the data list, so you won't be doing too much as far as the data list attack goes. Now, there is no notch either for keeping the aircraft carrier flat, so while handling it, you might bump them askew a little bit. Also, the joints are nice ratcheted joints, but it feels like they point the aircraft carriers down just a tiny bit, so that could have been better. The toy has landing gear. They're big, beefy metal landing gear with tires on it. Uh, they look obviously a little bit silly, but they do help you be able to roll the toy around. So you could be a kid on your floor playing with your cruiser as if it were flying through space. So getting a little bit more mileage out of that. If you wanted to, you could also take the toy. I'm gonna to lift up the storage bay just to create some clearance. And you can do that first scene in the show where the SDF-1 fires from cruiser mode. Not sure if it ever does that again after that, but so that is an option to you. And there you go. So cruiser mode overall, very good. Handles pretty firmly. You can knock a few things out of skew, but otherwise, nice and solid. As we transition to battle mode, let's take a moment to examine scale. At 38 centimeters long in cruiser mode, these toys are really big. That makes them nearly 12 centimeters longer than a Takatoka 155 scale VF-1 in fighter mode. And you can see how it stacks up to some capital ships you may have in your collection. If you do the math, that's a little smaller than 13,000 scale, but it's close enough. In battle mode, the toy is again 38 centimeters tall. At 715 grams, this toy is also very hefty. In fact, that's more than two Takatoku 155 scale VF-1 toys. Here we are in battle mode. Transformation is pretty simple, but I do have a step-by-step -step guide I encourage you to check out. Now, once we get here, people don't really think of the SDF-1 as being particularly dynamic, and this toy represents that pretty well. We have an elbow joint, nice ratchets, we do have the ability to spin the aircraft carrier around on that elbow joint, but it comes up 90 degrees. Then we have our shoulder, which we can rotate all the way around. We can pivot these guns however we please, and we can bring the arm out at the shoulder as well. Now, what we could do is try to get a punch motion because the Daedalus punch is cool. We can bring the arm back over here, get something like this. And then we have the ability to bring the leg forward or back one click of motion. And you can hear again, nice clicky sounds. And to help take advantage of that feature, we have feet that kind of pivot back and forth like so. What you don't get is the ability to bring the legs out, which would have been huge, or twist them at all. So we can step forward a little bit, get that punching motion like so. So that's one pose you'd really want to be able to do, and you can, so that's nice. The other thing we can do is get this toy to look a little bit more aggressive. But we don't have things like pivoting or rotating guns all over it. There is no panel to see Macross City. There are no lights and sounds. These are probably things we'd want to see on a modern take of this toy. Instead, what we get is the ability to make it look more aggressive by bringing up the landing gear, flaring out the chest, and then bringing the guns forward. So now it looks like it's ready to rush out 
meet the Zentradi where they are, wherever they are. You can bring them all the way down. You can kind of rock them kind of somewhat upward. And there you go. Looks good, looks aggressive. And if you're just gonna have this thing behind your VF1 toys on a shelf somewhere, that's a pretty good pose to have it in. While line art accuracy rarely is a strength of vintage toys, this one does pretty well. Yeah, we can nitpick some things. We lose some finer details, but we're spared large, painful proportion errors. It would have been nice if the center section stood further back in cruiser mode, but if you're not staring at the line art, you probably won't even notice. So the toy's big and hefty, and maybe it's hitting all the right nostalgia buttons for you. If you want to rush out and get one, there are a few things to look for besides the yellowing that comes with years. Begin by checking the shoulder-mounted rail guns. Those can be broken by doing something as simple as putting the toy forcefully back in the tray, and a fall from even the smallest distance is almost certain doom. Next, check the antennae on top of the bridge and the ones behind it. The antennae may be rubbery, but they're still frail, and it's rather easy for an errant hand placement to do some real harm. Finally, make sure you see pictures of the toy standing outside the tray so you can be certain the shoulder joints aren't broken. If Takatoku had to do it over again, they would have devised a better system for mounting the arms to the body. Fortunately, if anything is broken, the toy is very easily disassembled, so someone with enough ingenuity and some modeling skills can likely save it and possibly improve upon it. Hit that thumbs up button if you like this video. Want to see some vintage toys get updated reviews? Leave a comment and tell me which ones you want to see. Subscribe and be sure to check out the full review on anymoon.com. Thanks for watching.